I would also like to extend a special welcome to Reed Fendrick, Minister Councillor of the American Embassy, who is joining us tonight as a member of the audience. My name is Anne Wertheim, and I am Director of the John Adams Institute. It's my honor to welcome you uh, here tonight and tonight's guest speaker, Mark Denner, and our evening's moderator, Paul Schaeffer. It took almost three years of pleading before Mark Denner eventually accepted. Tonight, we are not only celebrating the presence of a great journalist, we are also celebrating the closing of the John Adams Institute lecture season, which started last September. Since being established in 1987, the John Adams Institute has evolved into Europe's leading forum for cultural exchange between the Netherlands and the United States. As many of you will already know, we have been blessed by the participation of many of America's greatest minds. Tonight's lecture is certainly no exception. I would like to use this opportunity to thank the many volunteers who have assisted the John Adams Institute this season. They help us send out our mailings, take tickets at the box office and the door, carry out research, clean up the attic, help with the production, write folders and letters, receive our guest speakers, build our website, and much, much more. Without them, it would be absolutely impossible to run this lecture series, and it's in your own um, well-being to give them an applause. <laughs> that is Sven Woodside at the door is our webmaster. <laughs> Tonight's event will be opened by Paul Scheffer, who has published extensively on political issues and taught modern history at several universities in the Netherlands. Aside to writing for NRC Handelsblad and working for the television broadcasting company VPRO, Mr. Scheffer is also a member of the board of the Atlantic Association. There will be no intermission tonight. After Mr. Denner's talk, Paul Schreffer will open the discussion with Mark Denner. The audience is invited to join in and ask questions. There are two microphones in the aisle, but if you are too far away, please stay seated, just stand up, uh, or just stand up and speak loudly. <laughs> the evening will be round up at around 9.30, with a few words from Box, uh, Bram uh, Boxhorn, who is the director of the Atlantic Association. I must make one more announcement before we begin. There is no smoking in this room. You're kindly requested to smoke outside or on the ground floor. And don't forget to turn off your cell phones. And uh, tomorrow night, Mark Denner will be interviewed in NOVA. I will now hand this enormous podium to Paul Scheffer. And thank you and enjoy your evening. Thank you very much. After all these welcomes and thanksgivings, um, it is my honor to um, introduce Mark Denner, who after three years, we heard it, uh, serious pleading, finally descended upon the Netherlands. He will speak about America and the post-Cold War world under the promising title, Helpless Giant. And of course, behind this question mark, there are numerous um, questions, observations, discussions, which have a certain fluency because many of the arguments about the decline of America, about the possible disengagement of America from Europe have been heard, have been debated, and are raised again in a different context. So we will hear much more about it. But first, let me introduce Mark Denner. He was born in Utica, New York. He graduated magna cum laude from Harvard, which is uh, indeed a good beginning, with a degree in modern literatures and aesthetics. Then he found his way through all these magazines of which an average journalist like myself can only dream. <laughs> 
He started at the New York Review of Books, the only European magazine which we know, because it's the only magazine which is read throughout Europe and debated, at least in the field of literature and nonfiction. Then he went to Harper's Magazine, then to Times Magazine, to wind up at the New Yorker. So all magazines of which one can only dream. Now he works as a visiting professor at the Graduate School of Journalism and he is Senior Research Fellow at the Human Rights Center, both at the University of California, Berkeley. When we want to say or to summarize um, what is the main focus of his writing, one could say that he looks after those spots and places where intervention starts with high-flown ideals and which often fails or runs into serious or compromising situations. So he reported about Haiti, he reported about American engagements and American silence about El Salvador, more specifically about the massacre at El Mozote. Then he wrote extensively about Bosnia. This is at the center of his work, and he combines very good writing with an analytical view, but also a moral engagement or moral questioning, which is, um, I think, in the line of writers like Robert Kaplan, Timothy Garton Esch, and uh, Michael Ignatiev. I think one can situate his writing in this uh, tradition, a new tradition, but nevertheless a tradition which is um, important because it breaks the academic barriers and it breaks the division of labor which often concentrates on very specific topics without ra asking the moral questions which are asked by a writer like Mark Denner. When we look at two specific places or two specific areas which he investigated, El Mozote, a remote village in the north of El Salvador where a massacre took place and where one finds the uh, contradiction or the conflict between on the one hand the Cold War and the engagement of the American government to stop the spread of communism and at the same time a betrayal of the ideals in the name of which the spread of communism was supposed to be stopped, that is to say, the engagement for human rights. Because the massacre at El Mozote was silenced, was suppressed, and in his book, Mark Denner details in a very elegant but very precise manner the way in which the American government dealt with this um, massacre. And so we see that truth and the communication of truth and the acknowledgement of what happened was suppressed. And then we look at Srebrenica in a completely different context. Mark Denner wrote extensively in a series for the New York Review of Books about the fall of Srebrenica in a completely different context, post-Cold World world. But nevertheless, an engagement also in the name of human rights and also struggling until this day was the question of truth. What happened exactly? Who is responsible? We've now witnessed in the last uh, weeks parliamentary investigations and still many questions remain to be asked and the Institute for War Documentation in the Netherlands will publish later, I think in one and a half year from now, its version of what happened in Srebrenica. But two parallel um, occasions in a very different context which raise nevertheless many questions. So to stop here my introduction, one could ask um, perhaps two questions um, which will be at the center of our discussion. First of all, given the engagement for human rights, what is the possibility or what is the capacity of a country like the United States with all its means, but nevertheless what is its capacity to influence the course of events in a country like Yugoslavia? What is the possibility to intervene in the dynamics of a country falling apart? And the second question is, of course, the question of political will. How far does political will reach, and not only in the United States, but also throughout the Western world, to engage oneself in the name of human rights for a situation like um, Bosnia? And there, Mark Denner uses the word betrayal quite often, 
It's in his writings, and one can ask, of course, what does it mean, betrayal? Betrayal of what? Of ideals? But I would like to ask to end my short introduction with a quotation from Reinhold Niebuhr in his famous book, Moral Man and Immoral Society, which will be at the center, I think, of our discussion. Try as he will, man seems incapable of forming an international community with power and prestige great enough to bring social restraint upon collective egoism. He has not even succeeded in disciplining anti-social group egoism within the nation. The very extension of human sympathies has therefore resulted in the creation of larger units of conflict without abolishing conflict. So, civilization has become a device for delegating devices of individuals to larger and larger communities. That will be perhaps one of the questions we will debate. Mark Denner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, Paul. <clears throat> Thank you for that wonderful introduction. I sometimes think I'll know that I'm full grown. I'm 41 years old. I sometimes think I'll know when I'm full grown when I can listen to an introduction like that and not wish my mother was sitting there hearing the same thing. Um, no, no, it's uh, fine. I thought I'd put it down a little bit. I assume everybody can hear me all right. Um, it's very nice to be here. Um, <coughs> Uh, I felt very close to Holland, to the Netherlands, uh, for many years. In fact, even before I visited this country, when I was a student, um, I spent a good deal of time in France hitchhiking around, uh, around France. And I believed, I was very proud of my French. Uh, I thought I spoke with an impeccable Parisian accent. Um, and time after time, I would get into a car of some generous driver. They would listen to me speak for a moment and say, ah, vous êtes hollandais. They would say, <laughs> I was a bit surprised at this at first. <clears throat> and then I decided it was much better to be taken as uh, a Dutchman speaking French than as an American speaking French. I felt that was a great improvement. And, uh, Speaking to Anna and Paul today, I'm starting to think it would be better to be taken as a Dutchman speaking English than an American speaking English, because both of them are so eloquent um, uh, in this language. Um, the uh, set of questions that Paul has just set out so well are enormous questions, and they might seem to be somewhat uh, abstract ones. Um, they are, of course, uh, as you know, very much in the center of our international life right now. Uh, and they're in the center of America's thinking about foreign policy. The idea of what moral responsibility the country has to act abroad, uh, what responsibility it has given its great power, its overwhelming power, its superfluity of power, um, to act when people are being killed in great numbers, as they have been uh, in parts of Africa and indeed in Europe itself, um, are a matter of daily debate, uh, not necessarily on the front pages, although they sometimes reach that, but on uh, the, say, the third segment of the news shows every evening. I chose to title this talk, uh, A Helpless Giant. The full quote is actually a pitiful helpless giant. Um, does anybody know where that quotation comes from? No one? Don't we have some Americans in the audience? <laughs> That's good. That's right. That's right. Richard Nixon. It's the only time in my life I think I've publicly quoted Richard Nixon. <laughs> I, want, I wanted to do it here in Holland, you know, where people wouldn't judge me as, you know, harshly as they might elsewhere. Um, uh, here we are. Richard Nixon used this phrase in announcing the, what he called the incursion into Cambodia in April 1970. Uh, 
many of you remember that this particular uh, step in American policy in Indochina led to enormous demonstrations on American campuses and to the deaths of uh, notably four students at um, Kent State University. Uh, it's a very famous incident. Um, let's see. President Nixon uh, from the Oval Office told the nation, if when the chips are down, the world's most powerful nation, the United States of America, acts like a pitiful, helpless giant, the forces of totalitarianism and anarchy will threaten free nations and free institutions around the world. It is not our power, but our will and character that is being tested tonight. It's a very Nixonian quote in that he identifies his own policy positions with a universal theme. But I'd also argue that it's a very American quote as well. That is, the United States can't take a step without it being considered in a universal context. Uh, it has to be a step not only to achieve a specific military goal in Indochina, um, but to prevent anarchy being loosed on the world. Uh, this is a strain of American thinking that I hope I can trace for you tonight and try to explain a little bit. I assume that it isn't identifying it, that is, doesn't surprise you in the least. Um, the history of it may be, I hope, a little bit illuminating. Um, I want to begin with several scenes from my own life of recent years, uh, what I've seen of the post-Cold World. Um, Paul, uh, in speaking of some of my work, um, alluded to some of these spots. I'm going to begin with a scene um, in the mountains of Central America, a um, very remote place, um, far from any metropolitan centers, uh, high up in the volcanic mountains near the border of Honduras, um, where a group of peasants are milling around um, several young people digging, people 20, 25 years old, digging with small instruments, spoons, uh, very tiny implements into the earth, digging around a space about the size of perhaps this much of the podium. Um, they've been digging for several days, and the peasants have been milling around quite silently watching them. Uh, I am standing amidst them. And at a point late in the morning, something begins to happen. And you can feel among the people watching and among the people working in the extraordinarily hot sun, uh, the tension rise. There in the earth at about 11 o'clock, like a fossil looming out of the earth, you see start to take shape what comes to be obvious is a skull. It is coffee brown, stained red and brown. Uh, it's been there for many years. And a few moments later, it's joined by another and another, and another. And over the course of that day and the next, it's joined by perhaps 120 skulls. What is remarkable about these skulls and the bones that uh, are joined to them is the fact that they are very small. They are the skulls of children. And over the next few days, about 130 of them will be uncovered. <clears throat> I was standing, when the first skull was uncovered, looking over the shoulder of a young artist who was trying to write down with impeccable accuracy the distribution of bones in the ground. Um, eventually, she, would try, she did levels uh, in detailing an archaeological site, levels of bones. Um, eventually there were seven or eight levels, stick figures, showing how the bodies were distributed. These levels were placed on vellum so that you looked down through them and could see a veritable ocean 
and confusion of bones. As you pulled each level up, you could see uh, 10 bodies, 15 bodies, 13 bodies, 20 bodies. And finally, at the very bottom, it's a series of dots, the last piece of paper, a series of dots, all of them impeccably drawn. I was able to bend over at a certain point and lift up one of those dots, because the dots were cartridges. And those dots proved the secret of El Masote, which was that, in fact, it had been a premeditated massacre, not a battle, that soldiers had stood outside of the windows of this particular building, which was called the sacristy, uh, part of a church, uh, had, reached, had pointed their guns in and had shot, in this case, 130 children, uh, including an unborn child um, who was found, whose skeleton was found uh, between the thighs of her mother. Um, and I remember very clearly, and this is the heart of this scene, looking at the cartridge and seeing stamped on it, made in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. This was the evidence that would link this to the Atlacatl, which was a brigade that was developed by the United States, um, trained by the United States, and was meant to be the solution to the post-war, post-Vietnam military conundrum, how does the United States secure El Salvador without forcing its people to send American troops. And the solution was to train Salvadorans in so-called elite battalions. This is one of their first major operations, El Masote, in which a thousand, uh, a thousand peasants were killed, roughly a thousand. The second scene was in 1994, during the occupation of Haiti. It took place on a street called Rue L'Enterrement in uh, Port-au-Prince, uh, Burial Street. I remember it in what photographers call a low-angle shot. That is, I was lying on the ground looking up. Um, everybody, all of my colleagues were lying on the ground as well because in front of us, about 40 feet away, were members of the FROP militia, FROP militia being the descendants of the Tonton Makuts, Duvalier's former militia and torture squad. They were shooting toward us. In back of us were members of Lavalas, which was Father Aristide, President Aristide's forces, um, who were throwing stones. FROP was shooting, um, Lavalas throwing stones. It moved back and forth, up and down the street, in a pitched battle that went on and on, oh, for three or four hours. And the journalists ebb and, ebbed and flowed with everyone else. Um, two things happened during this scene that are notable. The first is, at a certain point, I looked up and saw the glittering down the street, through the dust uh, and through the smoke from the guns, uh, the glittering of camera lenses, and I realized that some of my colleagues had managed to sneak around and take their places among the frop forces, that is, the bad guys. Um, I was able to sneak down myself just in time to see the frop people descend on a porch where the NBC reporter had taken refuge, and I saw a very interesting thing. One of the frap men with a gun pointed to the NBC reporter. The NBC reporter raised his hands. The frap man said like this, gestured with his gun. The NBC man moved aside and behind him was his Haitian fixer, the man who he employed to drive him and so on. And the frap fellow went pop, pop, pop and killed him. Um, one of several Haitians who died that day, but this one simply at the service of an American. The second incident that I remember from that day was the arrival of, Port-au-Prince was then under American occupation, and the arrival of Americans in an armored personnel carrier uh, at the corner of Rue L'Enterrement. Uh, I could see them, there were about, I think, eight or perhaps eight to ten of them. The armored personnel car carrier came up relatively quickly, stopped. They all jumped down in combat position, moved their guns around, looked, saw this confrontation underway, 
stayed for several moments, got back in the armored personnel car carrier, and left. Uh, they wouldn't engage. It wasn't part of the city that they were interested in. Um, and it wasn't a conflict that interested them. Finally, the last scene that I would put before you is from Sarajevo, the marketplace. We were traveling, I was working at the time on an ABC documentary, we were traveling to do a stand-up. Uh, the anchorman was there, the great star, who'd flown in for 24 hours uh, to do his star turn. We had to go and do all of his stand-up, the beginning, the end, the middle, everything, uh, which makes it seem like he's there all the time. Uh, of course, he's there for very briefly. Um, we were on our way, and suddenly, near the marketplace, from which we had just been reporting, uh, I saw a car emerge, a white, small white car, uh, with a bloody handprint on the side, a red handprint. We turned back in, drove in, and could smell immediately when we got out of the car the smell, unmistakable smell of cordite, of an explosion that had just occurred. Um, as I started walking out of the car, I slipped and fell on my back. So I was in a very large pool of blood. Uh, uh, and the whole, indeed the whole marketplace, which is not very large, it's perhaps twice the size of this room, um, throughout had large pools of blood and pieces of people everywhere and people yelling and screaming. And um, I slipped, fell, and got myself covered with blood, um, stood up and tried to start walking around and at least count the bodies, which was quite impossible to do um, because they had been so mangled. The mortar shell had fallen on the roof of the... Uh, marketplace and had made of its uh, corrugated tin roof shards of secondary explosive shards. In other words, it had blown them up and they had cut through the crowd as well as the mortars own shrapnel um, and had killed, it turned out, about 68 people but wounded a great many more. Um, I tried to do my job, walk around and actually count numbers and try to get some idea of the number of corpses, but sorry, Evans had already started throwing body parts onto the back of a truck, a dump truck. Um, by that time, because the siege had been going on three years, uh, people were very practiced in what you should do when a shell falls. Get rid of the dead, get the wounded into cars, and so on, and they were moving very quickly. But in the middle of the crowd, and this is the scene, or part of the scene I remember most vividly, stood a man, very big man, uh, who was, uh, had his mouth open and his hands up like this. At his feet was uh, what appeared to be a body, and a couple of men were restraining him. He was a giant of a man. And as I looked at him, I realized a couple of things. One was I had interviewed him a few hours before. He had been working at one of these small uh, stands selling that sold a wrench, a potato, a radish, you know, these pitiful little stands that were offering all Sarajevo had to offer at the time. Um, and I had interviewed him and his wife, who was now a bloody uh, bag, a uh, piece of baggage at his feet. I realized also that I couldn't, uh, my hearing had gone because he was shouting and I couldn't hear anything he was saying. Um, and I followed the gesture of his, he was looking up and uh, these people were hanging on him uh, like they were hanging on a strong man and he was looking up and I followed the direction of his sight um, and saw far above a beautiful silver plane circling, doing arabesques in the sky. This is an American F-15 on its regular patrol uh, over Sarajevo. Um, and he was shouting at it, uh, shouting at it. I don't know what he was shouting, but he was screaming at it. Um, those three scenes don't present in any way a reasoned argument.
but I hope they lay out, in some sense, a moral landscape that I can start to talk about, that Paul and I can continue, and that perhaps uh, you can argue about with me and us uh, as well. I'd like to talk a little, to point out a contradiction, and then talk a little bit about American, what's been called American exceptionalism. The contradiction is the obvious one uh, that uh, many magazines have written about, many writers, uh, in the last few years. That is, that the United States now stands at a point of predominance which one can remember few nations holding in the recorded history of the world. Uh, its economic power um, is unmatched. Its military power, well, the figure that's given most often is uh, the U.S. military budget is greater than that of the next eight countries, next eight high-spending countries combined, which is to say that the United States military budget uh, exceeds that of the Russians, the Japanese, uh, the French, the Chinese, the Germans, uh, the English, um, I'm not sure who I'm leaving out, the Indians perhaps. In any event, you get the idea. Uh, the United States budget is enormous. Its uh, disposition of forces is still very large. There are 100,000 troops still in Europe, 100,000 odd troops in Asia, Korea and Japan, 15,000 or more in the Persian Gulf, uh, 12 aircraft carriers still spread out around the globe, um, and yet, what might be called its military authority, that is, as opposed to military power, which is potential, its military authority, which is the expectation of others, whether they be countries or armed groups, that the U.S. might indeed use that power, is something much less, I would argue. Uh, the U.S. is viewed... You might have followed very recently uh, the arguments of the Secretary General of the United Nations and his disappointment when it came to the U.S. reaction to what's happening in Sierra Leone, in which the United States offered to lease transport planes to the United Nations. Um, there have been various versions of this kind of disappointment and capriciousness throughout the 10 years of what we have come to call, for lack of a better term, the post-Cold War world. Um, I would argue that uh, while capriciousness is a good word, um, uh, ambivalence would be a better one. The United States has intervened during those years in Somalia, in Haiti, uh, eventually in Bosnia and in Kosovo. But the interventions have been characterized uh, by an ambivalence as well. That is, I tried to describe in my scene from Haiti that though the United States troops were there, their involvement was strictly limited by an absolute horror of taking any casualties at all and I distinguish that from a policy that minimizes casualties, an absolute horror of taking any casualties at all. And I would argue that the United States uh, war fighting strategy in Kosovo, we can talk about this as well, was predicated as well on losing no planes, losing uh, no airmen, and needless to say, losing no soldiers. Now, this is a goal. It's very hard for an American to stand up here and say to you that the United States should lose its young people in wars. On the other hand, a policy such as this has very direct consequences for the success, what is meant to be or what is described as the success of a military intervention. Uh, in Haiti, it left a country that I would say in some ways is not very much better off uh, than it found it. Uh, in Kosovo, though the mission at the outset was defined as a human rights motivated mission to protect the Kosovar Albanians, uh, in fact, the intervention continued while the very people that intervention was meant to protect uh, 
were brutalized and expelled from their homes. Um, most of the intervention's military power was not directed at the very troops, the very forces of Milosevic that were engaged in harming the people that the United States had committed itself to protect. Let's reel back a little bit <clears throat> to the time of, uh, well, the time of the man for whom this august uh, institution is named, um, John Adams. Um, American exceptionalism is rooted far, far back in American history, before Adams's time, of course. Uh, some historians put its first obvious, that is, uh, in quotable manifestation uh, in the famous sermon by John Winthrop in which he talked about the city on the hill. The city on the hill. Some of you may remember that Ronald Reagan used this term to great effect during his presidency. And in fact, given the disinterest or the lack of interest, I should say, of many Americans in American history, a lot of Americans believe now that he created it. Ronald Reagan. Uh, I'm correcting my students all the time on this point. It's very irritating. Um, uh, for them, Ronald Reagan is the first American president, the first they remember, which is a, a prospect that gives me unallied horror, but I have to suppress it in the, in the classroom. Um, a city on a hill, what does this mean? The United States is a refuge. The United States is a paradise. The United States is something far apart. I should say America as something far apart. And far apart from what? Separated from the uh, depredations, the uh, diplomatic intrigues, the lust for power, the old world uh, corruption of old Europe. Earliest Americans, although the population is, has changed and is changing, the earliest, Ameri earliest Americans, of course, saw themselves in flight from the old Europe, in flight from what they left behind. American exceptionalism is something that existed long before American foreign policy. And it's something, it's, the strength of its rhetoric is such that politicians will return to it again and again and again, as President Nixon, in a way, did in the phrase I quoted to you at the outset. Um, the most famous uh, example of it, one I'm sure all of you know, is President Washington's admonition to avoid entangling alliances. This was in his farewell address. Avoid entangling alliances. He felt that any involvement, any permanent involvement in Europe, always in Europe, always in Europe, could only cost the country dear, could only besmirch its reputation, besmirch its interests, and cost it far, far more than it might benefit uh, the United States. Um, we come now to a quotation uh, that I particularly prize. And you should prize it as well, because it comes from a man who has, among his many achievements, uh, the uh, uh, mark on his resume of having attended Amsterdam Latin, uh, I was informed today, and having been thrown out of Amsterdam Latin. <clears throat> um, Latin school, excuse me, Amsterdam Latin school. Um, John Quincy Adams, of course, attended when his father was here as uh, uh, as America's first minister uh, in the, to the Netherlands. Um, and he attended uh, Amsterdam Latin School. And apparently, I'm sorry, correct me, but he was uh, uh, apparently a little too boisterous for the, the teachers and uh, responded somewhat physically, I think. But he was thrown out of the school. In any event, you can decide for yourselves how much this may have contributed to his later diplomatic career, how much this early trauma uh, had to do with it. It is definitely true that John Adams, John Quincy Adams, when he returned to the United States, although he's best known as uh, the son of the president and the only president's son who would subsequently become president so far, don't, 
Um, I knew someone would say that. <laughs> Very cruel. Um, actually, his greatest achievement is probably uh, uh, something that characteristically bears another name, that is the Monroe Doctrine. Um, which is the doctrine by another characteristically American act, uh, which essentially says the Western Hemisphere is ours. Europe will no longer uh, participate in colonizing or making trouble in the Western Hemisphere. It is our responsibility. And in characteristic American fashion, this is set down on a piece of paper. Um, America at the time had nowhere near the forces uh, to carry out this policy or to indeed expel uh, most European countries, the great European powers, had they a mind to take them up on the challenge. Um, I'll talk again about the Monroe Doctrine in a moment. But the phrase of John Quincy Adams that I was going to quote to you that I particularly love is uh, his admonition to, to Americans to go not abroad seeking monsters to destroy. Go not abroad seeking monsters to destroy. It's, it, actually, I completely love that. And I would love it if my students began to think that, in fact, I had coined it. But um, I don't know if that will happen. If I repeat it enough, perhaps it will. Um, so again, um, the same current. That is, if you, well, let me put it in a little broader terms. The United States is a country blessed by God, blessed by abundant national, natural resources, self-sufficient, protected uh, on its Atlantic side, which was then the border, by a broad ocean with manifest destiny, another great American phrase, to fill out and own the rest of the country to the Pacific at which time it would be protected by broad seas on either side uh, and would be essentially impregnable to foreign attack. And the only way the United States, this God-given land, with a universalist philosophy that every, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident, um, this is taken to be for every man, not every American. Uh, the only way the United States can breach this trust is by involving itself in the affairs of corrupt older powers. Now, what I'd like to say to you is, as the century wore on, this philosophy, which is still very strong, began to take on increasingly the character of a waking dream. That is, it was a beautiful, beautiful image, and it maintains its beauty today. It had very little to do with reality. The United States was growing in leaps and bounds. Why? Particularly past the midpoint of the century, partly because of trade. How was it able to do this without a great navy and a great military force? And the lack of a great military establishment allowed much more rapid growth than would have happened otherwise, and also allowed for the fact that you didn't need a, a greatly centralized government or administration. The U.S. was able to grow in the way it did because it was shielded by the Navy of Great Britain. And, of course, the great dirty secret of the 19th century, and indeed up until 1914, really, is that the United States was able to endure with this philosophy because it was protected by the, Navy, the Royal Navy and also by Great Britain's policy of balancing on the continent. That is Great Britain's 19th century policy, which it uh, carried out throughout the century, of ensuring that no single power uh, was able to dominate the European and Eurasian landmass. Only in 1914 did it become evident to many Americans that the ideology I'm identifying here uh, was in some degree a myth. The great irony is that it became evident during the First World War under the presidency of a president who embodies perhaps more than any other 
the philosophy of American exceptionalism and American idealism. And that, of course, is Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Wilson, I mean, one only needs to spout off um, some of his more enduring phrases, particularly a war to end all wars, a war to secure, to make universal democracy. Um, he believed that the First World War, at least he talked about it, was a universalist crusade. After he finally persuaded Americans to get involved in the war very, very late, uh, and long after the U.S. could have, well, that's arguable, only after he persuaded Americans to get involved in the war with the help of U-boat attacks on U.S. shipping and German conniving with Mexico did the United States get involved in 1917. Wilson came to Europe a triumphant figure. He came to Paris a triumphant figure. He was in a position to have a benevolent dominant effect on the post-war order. That is, to help impose uh, a lasting peace. He failed miserably. Failed miserably. Why? Because of universalist ambitions, League of Nations, elimination of war. Uh, to read about the Conference of Paris is remarkable, for you see these canny, I mean, it's almost as if uh, the warnings of uh, Washington and uh, Adams and many others were coming to, here in Versailles, were coming into um, uh, absolute fruition. Wilson's kept spouting universalist rhetoric, and meantime, David Lloyd George Clemenceau and the other leaders divided up the spoils of Europe and came up with a peace that, uh, in the event, did much to ensure that there would be, like night follows day, another war 20 years uh, farther on in the century. Um, Wilson came back to the United States and tried to sell his vision to the American people and to the Senate. Uh, it was a dramatic effort, and I urge any of you who are interested in this period at all to read, uh, there's a new biography of him by Louis Auchincloss, a short 150-page biography. It's a fascinating story. He embarked on a whistle-top stop tour around the United States trying to argue above the heads of the Senate, the U.S. must join the League of Nations. The League will be a disaster without the United States. It will be stillborn. During this tour, uh, Wilson had a stroke. Eventually, it killed him. The United States did not join the League. American power was, was, in effect, withdrawn from the continent. Americans know this period of the 30s as the age of isolation. That's what you learn in your school books when you're studying American history. It's a funny kind of isolation. At this, during this age of isolation, American troops were occupying Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, by Louis Auchincloss, a short 150-page biography. It's a fascinating story. He embarked on a whistle-top stop tour around the United States, trying to argue above the heads of the Senate, the U.S. must join the League of Nations. The League will be a disaster without the United States. It will be stillborn. During this tour, uh, Wilson had a stroke. Eventually, it killed him. The United States did not join the League. American power was, was, in effect, withdrawn from the continent. Americans know this period of the 30s as the age of isolation. That's what you learn in your school books when you're studying American history. It's a funny kind of isolation. At this, during this age of isolation, American troops were occupying Nicaragua, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, uh, let's see, Cuba, in effect, um, the Philippines. This was isolation. Isolation means Europe. U.S. power was withdrawn from the continent. Uh, the democracies, particularly France and Britain, as all of you know, you know this history better than I do, 
um, and the new states that under Wilson's tutelage were created in the East, which was probably his singular achievement in Paris and Versailles, uh, were rendered vulnerable. Um, the democracies, exhausted having lost a full generation of men, uh, could not oppose the rising totalitarian powers. And this is a matter of obviously great debate, uh, and we're going over it in a very fast way. Um, but the general point to me is clear, which is the United, the United States, because of the failure of Wilson to pragmatically ensure American involvement in Europe, permanent American involvement, I don't necessarily mean troops, I mean interests, the Second World War to some extent was foreordained. Now why am I taking such time with the First World War? Because it led directly to the Second and because the statesmen involved in the Second World War setting up the order that we know of as the Cold War and which we still refer to in the present age, we refer to our age as the post-Cold War era. We still define ourselves against the Cold War. The Cold War and its institutions, many of them very respectable institutions, and very successful institutions, were defined and created by men who had seen firsthand the failures of Wilson after the First World War. They were determined to ensure a permanent American role in, on the continent. They feared American isolationism. They feared the departure of, Europe, of America from Europe and what it would mean. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Harry Truman, George Marshall, Dean Acheson, all of these men were very aware of what had happened to Wilson. And though in some ways they fit into a Wilsonian mode, they were determined to avoid his mistakes. How did they do this? How did they do it? What is the modern US philosophy? Why was it involved for the first time as a permanent player on the world scene? I would argue to you tonight that they did it by creating a philosophy that married idealism, exceptionalism, in the long ago American sense that I've tried to describe to a geopolitical reality, which is the Soviet Union, an immediate threat at all points on the globe. These two ideas were put together with such seamless beauty that one has to look back in awe at the accomplishment. And I would argue to you, to, I would argue today that it might not have been so. I want to read you a quotation. President Truman. This is from President Truman, March 12, 1947, before Congress. At the present moment in world history, nearly every nation must choose between alternative ways of life. One way of life, to, life is based upon the will of the majority and is distinguished by free institutions, representative government, free elections. The second way of life is based upon the will of the minority, minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. It relies upon terror and oppression, a controlled press and radio fixed elections. I believe it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. That last sentence is absolutely key. The man who wrote it, Clark Clifford, an advisor of many presidents, first of all, uh, Truman, called it the credo, the sense of the Latin mass. This is the credo. This is the heart of the speech. I believe it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Now, we are so accustomed to hearing this sort of thing, it sails by our ears or at least it sails by my ear. But I'd point out to you what an odd statement this is. There's no limit on it as a statement of policy. It, talk, it doesn't talk about 
uh, free peoples in Europe or free peoples in China or free peoples in Japan. It talks about free peoples. What kind of policy statement is that? And indeed, people at the time, some of America's major foreign policy intellectuals, attacked it on, in exactly those, on exactly those terms. George Marshall, then Secretary of State, hated it, complained that speech was full of rhetoric, so full of rhetoric as to be almost useless. Uh, Walter Lippmann, in a response I love, called the speech the vague global policy that sounds like the toxin of an ideological crusade that has no limits. It cannot be controlled. Its effects cannot be predicted. Now, it was a hugely successful speech. What do I mean by that? A lot of people criticized it, but it did what it, excuse me, it did what it was intended to do, which is it helped shape a consensus for a permanent American role on the world scene, which had never happened before. It's very odd today we talk about the post-Cold War world, what the U.S. will do, how it behaves, etc. In, in a strange way, the Cold War was the odd period in which there was a single adversary with an ideology, universalizing ide ideology that mirrored that of the United States and which was used by U.S. leaders to build public consensus for a role that was absolutely unknown in U.S. history. The period that is more characteristic of the world scene, I would argue, happens to be right now. And although there are great moans throughout the United States that the U.S. has no philosophy, it has no doctrine, it has no containment policy uh, that would follow George Kennan's containment policy, it has no guide, in fact, this is the normal state of great powers. What's different for the United States is it has never been in this position before. Let me make a few more comments about the Truman Doctrine and the ideology that guided the United States during the Cold War. It was a way to build public support. Um, it was an ideology that had to do with crusading, with America being different with America coming to the aid of people everywhere that fit very well in American history. Um, it also was no guide to intelligent policy making. Now, that wouldn't immediately be a problem, you would think. That's the job of statesmen, the bureaucrats and the foreign policy institutions that sprang up like mushrooms uh, after 1947 in the United States. They're the ones who are supposed to make intelligent policy decisions. But we reach a funny point here, what I tend to call, in a rather pretentious way, the Athenian problem. The U.S. is trying to make foreign policy in a democracy. It's trying to behave like a quasi-imperial power while having a democracy at home. The Truman Doctrine was a direct appeal to that democracy to ensure continued world role by making sure Americans understood the human rights and ideological, excuse me, idealistic elements of America's role abroad. It set down no limits. It set down no limits and thus set down no guide uh, to intelligent action. So that Dean Acheson, for example, when he tried to treat with Mao in the early 50s, before the Korean War, found himself in the midst of an enormous scandal. Why? Because foreign policy had been defined as anti-communism. Anti-communism. Point final. Boom. Anti-communism. Suddenly there was a white paper, there were, you know, there was an enormous scandal. Acheson became known as the Red Dean uh, the pink dean? The red dean. Red dean. Um, in other words, foreign policy had become, although it had always been so in the U.S., had become defined as a, um, oh no, I'm being dragged off the stage. By the yes. Well, thank you.
the question period should begin. Absolutely. Yeah. Huh? I was just getting to our time. <laughs> Well, on his right, I've gone on too long uh, before getting to the present. <laughs> Let me sum up some of what I just said, and we'll get to, we'll get to a discussion. I apologize, Paul. Um, when we look at some of the disasters of U.S. foreign policy during the Cold War, and there were disasters, as people tend not to remember now, most notably Vietnam, Part of this, and I think it's little appreciated today, resulted from the fact that U.S. foreign policy is embedded in the domestic realm. Uh, there's a wonderful tape, Lyndon Johnson taped a lot of his, uh, a lot of his um, telephone conversations. As Richard Nixon always claimed, bitterly, everybody did it. Um, and there's a wonderful conversation between Lyndon Johnson and Richard Russell, who was a powerful senator from Georgia, in 1964. It was before Johnson made the decision to send troops, a vast number of troops, into Vietnam. And it's a wonderful conversation. He's, Johnson's saying, ah, I don't want to do this. Ah, uh, who needs to do this? this is, we can't win this. This is 64. Terrible decision. Don't want to do it. And at the end, and, and the senator's saying, Mr. President, I agree with you completely. You, you can't do it. It's a terrible idea. And at the end of it, Johnson says, well, you know, but they'd impeach a president who ran out of there, wouldn't they? They'd impeach a president who ran out of there, wouldn't they? And it's not remembered very clearly today, the domestic politics that surrounded Vietnam. Um, a quick point on the post-coal world, our subject tonight, um, <laughs> which we'll elaborate on in a moment. This consensus, uh, shaky as it was, weak as it was as a guide to intelligent action, broke down after Vietnam uh, and is gone today. It's been replaced by what I called in a conversation with Paul earlier today, a post-ideological foreign policy, one made up of scraps and shards of what preceded it. On the one hand, a longing to play a moral role in the world. On the other hand, a great fear of corruption by involvement in the world's affairs. Um, both of these currents, I hope I've shown, are obvious in American history. And it's no surprise that they're coming out uh, very dramatically right now. And I hope in the next few minutes, with the help of Paul, we can bring them out even more vividly. And I thank you for your attention. Please sit down. Thank you very much. And I think it was a good idea to um, take us back in the history because um, one gets a far more vivid picture of the Cold War era. Mm -hmm. And it's necessary because um, when one compares um, the period before 89 and after 89, there is still an engagement. We will talk about it later. but. Perhaps uh, the ambivalence where you started out between the huge capacity to intervene and to engage oneself in the United States and the haphazard or contradictory manner in which it's often done as perhaps um, a good reason because during the Cold War, as you portrayed, there was a strong linkage between human rights activism and what was perceived as a threat to vital interests the um, universalizing effect of communism mm -hmm. and of the Cold War. And now perhaps what one sees is that there is a divorce between, on the one hand, human rights activism, and on the other hand, security interests. And perhaps that explains the ambivalence and the reluctance of many governments, not only the American government, to intervene, for example, in Yugoslavia. I think that's, I would ag agree to that completely. I'd say, I, I would narrow it down a little and say that in the absence of a clear consensus, uh, 
or what's perceived to be by politicians, by political leaders, a clear consensus on when the United States should act, on what its vital interests are. Um, a consensus, an ad hoc consensus, must be built on every occasion. Um, I point the most obvious and actually successful example of this, I think, is George Bush before the Gulf War, in which he struggled. I mean, now it's thought of as, of course, very popular. At the time, it was not. In the period between August 90 and January 91, when the war began, uh, Bush ran around justifying it in various ways from, you know, uh, nuclear armed Saddam, uh, we have to face down aggression, um, uh, jobs, 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 I don't know if you remember that, the economic reasons, and he finally settled on, characteristically, uh, defending democracy from that tyrant, Saddam Hussein, who is, quote, worse than Hitler. That was the most successful uh, attempt at bringing up the poll numbers uh, to actually fight a war in the Gulf. Um, now, he was most successful, Bush, in that instance. The other instances that we see, Clinton before Haiti, for example, and I'll get back to Yugoslavia in just a second, but Clinton before Haiti, Clinton before Kosovo, um, we see political leaders who are not really, uh, do not see the return on political capital that they can gain by supporting a foreign invention or doing much to support it. Uh, Clinton made one speech before Haiti. You know, this is not a major effort by a president to prepare for uh, um, military intervention. And the result is that because the political backing for it is so weak at home, because it's so unpopular among the American people, it doesn't mean they're necessarily marching on the streets. It simply means they answer poll takers, you know, three out of four say, we don't think this is necessary. It means that the intervention itself represents a huge political risk. And it's undertaken in a way to minimize that risk. And modern munitions uh, have made it increasingly possible to minimize dramatically that risk. I mean, no but, soldiers were lost in Haiti. Now, Yugoslavia. But, but, yeah, but you, well, seem to, you seem to be quite critical of it, whereas one could also say that minimizing risk is a duty and a necessity for every politician mm -hmm. in, a, in a democracy. One can say when, that. When there are no vital interests, mm -hmm. no no direct threat. Well, well, of course, that's at, a big stake. That's a big. When, I mean, to say when there are no vital interests, uh, I think vital interests, of course, is a very loaded term. Vital interests are usually taken to mean something that will eventually threaten the stability or safety of the state. Haiti was not that. And if you're going to say we should never undertake any military action in the absence of a threat to the vital interests of the United States, that is a very logical and lucid. Policy, policy, although it will be controversial. That is not now the policy of the United States. Haiti uh, was undertaken for a variety of reasons, some of them domestically important. That is, Florida, uh, its importance as an electoral state um, with electoral votes. Uh, the Black Caucus, its interest in Haiti and its uh, fidelity to Clinton for years. Um, but mostly refugee, the refugee problems in Florida. Now, my view is if you are going to undertake a military intervention, of course, of course, of course, you minimize risk to your troops and your forces. But the key item must be to achieve the mission that you're setting out uh, uh, to complete. That is, if you're trying to somehow set Haiti on a more stable course, and that is a very big project, you at least make an attempt to do that. Um, you know, it's very hard to say, well, there's, you know, what if there were 10 casualties? What if there were 20? But that is a real question. I mean, it was a real question in Kosovo. How many Kosovars could have been saved if there were 50 injured Americans? And would that have been worth 5,000 still living Kosovar Albanians? I, I don't know the answer to that question. Well, I do know you, there is. But somehow you seem to know the answer because you use words like um, the great betrayal, to the point, Bosnia. So this sense of betrayal means that you have an idea and you have a commitment where you, you 
argue that the foreign policy which engaged itself mm -hmm. in areas like Let's Bosnia then to fulfill the objectives which you set yourself, you have to take risks. Let's talk about Bosnia for a moment. Well, let's uh, talk about world betrayal. That's what interests me. Well, you know, I, you, you I'd love to do that, except that in was an easy manner. I'm afraid that was the editor's word and not mine. No. <laughs> it was a headline. That's what I always say, but <laughs> somehow well, it, it never works. It was a headline, but it, you know, never used the word drama, for example. Oh, I, I see. Okay, I'll, I'll, thank you for giving me these these guidelines, which I which I need. Um, betrayal. Um, betrayal is an easy word. It is a headline word. I'm not sure I would begin a discussion of Bosnia by using that word. I mean, you know, I have to be candid with you. I'm not backing down on what I wrote in anything. Uh, I mean, I would have changed some things, perhaps, but not in large sense at all. Um, I think, though, what you have to look at is, in looking at Yugoslavia and the United States' role there, um, I would not use the word betrayal, but I would put it in the context of the political world that I've tried to sketch out today. Uh, the United States uh, had word from the CIA in a national intelligence estimate, which is a big paper from all the intelligence agencies, in the fall of 1990. This is when the buildup in the Gulf War was going on. The Yugoslavia was going to explode. There was going to be a war there. And there were, uh, it would happen within 18 months. You know, the CIA should always be as accurate as they were on this occasion. Um, now, um, very little was done uh, about it, even to develop a policy. Uh, the attitude of the administration, uh, which was, and this is the Bush administration, was very interesting. Uh, you had at the top, just by, well, not quite by happenstance, but you had two officials right at the top, the Deputy Secretary of State, Larry Eagleburger, who'd been ambassador to Yugoslavia, uh, knew the country very well. Brent Scowcroft, who was air attaché and who was then national security advisor. So you had the two, two of the most important officials in the American government knew this country very well. Their attitude was, stay out. You know, it is, this is a swamp. Now, why were they thinking that way? I would argue that there were very strong domestic concerns in the spring of 1991, particularly after uh, the Gulf War and the great victory in the Gulf War and the great political gains that were accrued thereby, which President Bush had unprecedented poll numbers, 90% approval, um, that, you know, why sh we can skate to re-election. I mean, I'm putting this in very shortened terms. I don't think these are bad men. I think they have to make decisions in a political world. We can... Now, if this had happened during the Cold War, there would be no doubt about it, was one of the points I'm trying to make. There was a, it wouldn't have happened, but there was, this was one of the frameworks for decision. I mean, southeastern Europe would not have been allowed to break into a hot war. At this point, though, it became a political issue. Why should we ruin our poll numbers and get into what could be a complicated, long-running conflict in southeastern Europe in a country Americans don't know much about, don't care much about, uh, when we are sitting pretty for re-election, and, you know, what is the reason for making this commitment? Um, now, you can talk a lot about later policies with Clinton and so on, um, but I think this was very important early on. And wasn't there a justified sentiment that uh, after the Cold War, uh, Europe... Um, should find and could find its own responsibility. Yes. And there was this eagerness, we all remember, you know, them running Absolutely. to Brioni I to remember. save Yugoslavia. And, you know, it was the word, this is, this Europe, is the, the time for Europe has this come. This is the hour of Europe. This is the hour of Europe. Well, Actually, there proved should to be <laughs> 10 years of, of quite a heavy mess. A long but, hour. But um, there could have been, and there was, I guess, a justified sentiment now it is Europe's Absolutely. first responsibility. I would argue to you, I mean, first of all, Jacques Pousse, the foreign minister of Luxembourg, is, is going to be unfairly, he's a fine gentleman, he's going to be unfairly remembered throughout history for saying, this is the hour of Europe. Um, that quote is going to be hung on him, and it's a sad, a sad business indeed. Um, but yes, I, I agree with what you just said. But it doesn't say at all, because... Uh, at the time that the United States took the Yugoslavia problem and said to the Europeans, you know what, this is a mess, 
you do it. You want to be, you want to, you know, handle your own affairs? Fine, here. At that point, the development of European institutions for handling such a problem was, as they still are, although it's somewhat different now, they were embryonic. There was most obviously no military capability to back up diplomacy. Once NATO was taken off the table entirely, I'm not, I'm not saying that Europe had to be prepared to intervene in Yugoslavia in the early 90s. Well, actually, I am saying that. Yes. I'm not saying Yugos Yugoslavia, I'm not saying Europe would have intervened. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that for effective diplomacy, for diplomacy to have been effective in 1990, 1991, there had to be something on the table besides diplomatic pressure. There had to be economic, true economic incentives, which there were not. That is, the Europeans had to be in the position, or the Americans as well, of putting up a substantial amount of money to help uh, an economy in Yugoslavia that was a disaster. And it was a disaster partly because of loans that had funded Yugoslavia as a quasi-Cold War ally. You know, this, none of this happens in a vacuum. It's all connected to history, uh, very recent history. So there had to be money on the table, and there had to be a, at least a threat, or not even a threat, threat goes too far, a possibility of military engagement. I mean, diplomacy is just not... In a situation like that, diplomacy itself cannot exist, it just can't exist in a vacuum. So at the time the Americans handed this over to Jacques Pouss, uh, let's see, it was Luxembourg, Portugal, and Holland, if I'm not mistaken, that group, um, I don't believe there was any true possibility that that war could have been ended by the Europeans at that time. And I think the Americans were well aware of that. I'm not saying that was the betrayal. I think on the American side, officials felt the Serbs would win and that they would win quickly. And they thought the best thing they could do would be to avoid a political catastrophe at home and just stay out of the way and let the Serbs win. It's the only thing that really explains American policy, I think. Um, was it a betrayal? I don't know. And we can get to larger questions of U.S. policy toward Europe. I said at the end that I think our policy now around the world is made up of shards and remnants, both on the human rights side and on the geopolitical realist side, if you want to call it that, of policy during the Cold War. And part one of those very important shards is the great ambivalence of the United States with respect to Europe. The U.S. supposedly wants the Europeans to get out of its shadow and develop an independent defense and foreign affairs capability. On the other hand, it doesn't. On the other what, hand, it doesn't. And what wins in the end? Well, uh, it depends whether, um, you know, it's funny. We're, we're used to here talking about, we say the United States, like it's a thing. It's not, of course. It's, it's a congeries of lobbies, of bureaucracies, of uh, power centers, of the army, of the intelligence agencies, of the Congress, all fighting for influence, and the foreign policy elite, which should not be underestimated. Uh, and the foreign policy elite in the United States, uh, you know, to me, when I look at what's happened in the last 10 years, one of the great mistakes of the last 10 years, I think, has been the enlargement, the continuing enlargement of NATO. I think that uh, has been a very short-sighted policy. Um, it's been driven on, it seems to me, by a sense of inertia uh, in what should happen, uh, in particular, in the relationship between the United States and Europe. I don't think NATO should be ended. I don't think it should be eviscerated. I don't think it should be vitiated. But I think the idea that it's going to take in the Baltics and eventually Ukraine is absolutely nuts. It's crazy. And that is the vision under which American policy is proceeding at the present moment. Now, Americans, I can tell you, are not ready to defend Poland with a nuclear guarantee. And in fact, there is a nuclear guarantee now But they were willing. they were willing to defend Turkey? Well, I, w I would say during the, cold, during the Cold War they were. 
Um, so, but that's, that's perhaps more the precise no, question. Oh, no, I don't, to, I, to actually, extent, I don't think it is. Oh, to what extent now, given right. the fact that there is no global conflict, goes the willingness to engage oneself? And there I must say that for me the question is more how to explain the continuing engagement of America, also in Yugoslavia, also with enlargement of NATO. I mean, that is more surprising than let's say, the argument that there is a strong inclination not to engage yourself continuously in Europe or elsewhere. That's I mean, a, that seems to be quite logical. Absolutely. I think you put, you know, uh, I think you put your finger on, on the key issue. Uh, and I think right now there is a struggle going on within the United States. When I say within the United States, I mean publicly, within the polity itself, but also within the various institutions that make up the U.S. government and make up a national security bureaucracy that was built in the late 40s, that worked very well, uh, but that was built for a different world, uh, about what the future uh, United States policy should be. And I would say, if I had to make a prediction, um, I would say that the United States will eventually bow to the, to the inevitable and encourage Europe to build a separate defense capability that, in fact, is real, the separate foreign policy capability that is real, that exists. Uh, that's going to be hard for Europe to do as well. I mean, both players, if you can call it that, are going to have to take on a very different attitude toward what their relationship is. And that will also involve the Russians. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. big problems, it seemed to me, with NATO enlargement was the, the uh, completely artificial um, attitude and foolish attitude toward the Russians. Yes, but, but if you criticize that, and that would be my last question before inviting mm -hmm. the audience, but if you criticize NATO enlargement, then you should be far more critical of interventionism as it is now, because uh, the enlargement of NATO was sold to the Russians as uh, the enlargement of a purely defensive alliance. <laughs> and now, um, just three weeks after the formal enlargement, right. the out-of-area doctrine, which was an old wish of the United States dating before 89, that NATO should engage itself outside of its territorial boundaries, now, with the out-of-area policy, which you can criticize or adopt, but at least it's obvious that it is seen by the Soviet, by the Russians, <laughs> as a major um, threat to their security interests because the enlargement combined with out-of-area policies, that is really combining perhaps two provocations. Ab absolutely. I mean, you know, the Russians... Yes, but then your interventionism, how does it sit with... Um, with the out-of-area out area policy? Yes, and with the perceived interests of, the, of Russia, which you seem to be concerned about. Well, you point up a contradiction that I would argue is only an apparent contradiction. Um, I think I have to back that up, however. Um, when you look at the last 10 years, um, if indeed the Russians had been taken into account, um, if NATO had been not, I mean, we can envision an alternate history of the last decade. The Russian sense of, of uh, uh, disappointment, as it were, or grievance, begins with the very idea, of course, that NATO could be enlarged, because they felt under President Bush, who managed uh, the uh, uh, reconstitution um, of Germany under his administration, they felt they had a guarantee, if they let this go on peacefully and did not oppose it diplomatically, they had a guarantee that NATO would not be pushed to their doorstep. Um, now, there's a great argument about whether that was ever put in writing or not. Some people argue there are instruments that exist in which that was written down. So their sense of grievance begins then. Now, if you want to put an alternate construction on the last 10 years, that is, how could it have happened differently, you could have said to begin the following. Uh, are we concerned, is our great concern that is, and I say R is the United States, with bolstering democracy and market capitalism in Eastern Europe, Eastern and Central Europe. Is that the major concern? Then the way to do that is to do it one way or another through the European Union, not through a military alliance like NATO, 
ah, we can't do that. The European Union, how can you do that? It'll take forever. You know, the French, they'll go crazy. They'll have Polish tomatoes coming in. The French truck drivers will block the roads. Ah, how can you do this? Um, and I would point out to you, I mean, this, these were the arguments made in the United States. I would say to you that the European Union is as much a creation of the Cold War as NATO is. And that the idea that it should be prepared to welcome a new Europe and it should do so with the help of the United States and the subtle urging of the United States is perfectly appropriate. Now, if that had happened, and if a different policy had been taken toward Russia, that is a policy that actually encouraged economic growth through direct engagement by the United States, um, rather than through international institutions that were, I would say, acted inadequately. I mean, I don't think I have any illusions about um, uh, the difficulty with which Russian reform could have been achieved. But the eventual, what I'm eventually pointing toward is, you know, something like the Kosovo intervention where you saw NATO-Russian animosities develop to the breaking point. If you consider a group of Russian uh, armored personnel car carriers on the Pristina airport, the breaking point, it's not exactly the beginning of World War III, nonetheless, uh, where that developed to the breaking point, one could imagine an alternate history where Kosovo, the problem of Kosovo, might have been solved, resolved, ameliorated with the help of the Russians. Now, uh, you know, if you say this to Richard Holbrook, he's going to say, what are you, crazy? You know, the Russians drove us nuts throughout, you know, throughout Srebrenica. We could have intervened in Bosnia if not for the Russians, the Security Council, blah, 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 blah. But I'm envisioning something that started farther back uh, in which the Russians feel they have a stake in Europe and the stability of Europe and above all in the st stability of southeastern Europe, which, you know, is a critical area of Europe now. Um, now, was this a betrayal? Certainly not. Okay. Terrible word. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, may I invite someone in the audience to? Yes, please. I have a question. Uh, wait, I'm yes, if you would use the microphone, that would universalize your <laughs> question. <laughs> Sorry? And idealize it. Yes. belongs to the present time, I think still is within the post-war area. Um, you are familiar probably with the rocket shield the administration wants to develop. Uh, I'm sorry, what did he say? The rocket, rocket shield. protection shield. Oh, yeah, oh, of course, yes, yeah, sorry. Right. Um, you also probably have read what Putin, the American, uh, Russian president, uh, offered to co in a way to cooperate with the Americans. Uh, can you explain to me why the American administration replied in such a cool way? Well, I, can, uh, I think that's a very good question. And um, I can give you a one-word answer or a several-word answer. The one-word answer would be politics, um, domestic politics. And I don't think this is cynical to say this. We're talking about a uh, missile, anti-missile defense program. And it's now called National Missile Defense, NMD, uh, to divorce it uh, to some degree from its predecessor, SDI, Strategic Defense Initiative and even divorce, divorce it farther from its sobriquet, which is Star Wars, uh, which the Reagan administration never liked. Um, this is a program that's taken on, though it has never achieved um, even approach to reality. That is, it's not ready to deploy. Uh, its tests have tended to be fairly disappointing, although on the credibility of those testers is, is very much in doubt at the moment. Um, it has been a dream 
um, since 1983 when President Reagan, in a striking speech, announced it uh, to the American people. It was politically very useful uh, during that time. Uh, and members of the audience will remember that that was the era of the nuclear freeze movement, uh, which achieved not only great allegiance here, uh, but also in the United States. And as a political response to it, it was absolutely brilliant. Um, uh, I don't, but I don't mean that to say Ronald Reagan was insincere. I think he was very sincere. Uh, but it has attained. Uh, there's actually a book I would recommend to you. It's just come out by Francis Fitzgerald, uh, called "Way Out There in the Blue." It's a history of Reagan and the Strategic Defense Initiative, and it is a brilliant, wonderful book. Um, now, this has attained a degree of political allegiance that is absolutely stunning in the U.S. The Republicans are very much behind it uh, and have been since Reagan's time. What has changed under the Clinton administration is that many Democrats are behind it. Um, and they're behind at least Clinton a couple of years ago made a decisive shift uh, to at least back research on what might or might not be a limited defense. Now, uh, the political possibilities of simply saying we're not doing this, that is, we're not doing defense, are recognized now in the United States as publicly impossible. That is, a lot of Americans believe there's a defense already. And uh, it's politically very popular. Uh, Clinton, who is a whatever else you think of him, is a master politician, uh, has given his support to something along the lines of strategic defense. They're now saying it will be to uh, defend against rogue states, uh, the most developed of which at the moment, as far as its nuclear program goes, is North Korea. So it will be based on the west coast of the United States and Alaska. It will protect against rogue missiles from North Korea, etc. Um, this involves also the Chinese nuclear program. The Chinese worry that their missiles won't get through, they will crank up their nuclear program, uh, which will be supposedly an unintended consequence. On the other hand, many backers of SDI argue that in a confrontation, say, over Taiwan, um, if the Chinese threatened, as they have some of their public rhetoric has recently, to hit Los Angeles, the U.S. needs uh, a defense of Los Angeles to act freely with Taiwan. Now, all of these matters aside, why did he respond coolly? Um, because at home, uh, you cannot abandon the national missile defense, and uh, it's become politically impossible to do. And he's now trying to square a circle, which, is, which existed during the Reagan administration, too. How do you secure uh, dramatic reductions of the Russians' land-based missiles at the same time as you're putting up a strategic defense that will theoretically make it harder for those missiles to hit the United States and thus form their, their deterrent function. Um, and the, the final part of this, the kind of horrible part, is the United States public position is now that the Russians should keep a certain number of missiles on constant alert so they won't be worried about the U.S. missile defense, which is a you know, fairly horrible idea and something right out of Dr. Strangelove. Um, okay. But don't you think I'm, that a missile drill is totally important between the Russian and American relations um, as such? Uh, to come to an agreement, you mean? Be, you mean if the, uh, the Russians and work uh, oh under their under their plan? Right. Um, well, the only I think the short answer here is that. Uh, within the American administration, I don't know that at this point the Russians' proposal is taken terribly seriously. I think it's thought of not as a technologically serious proposal, uh, 
but as a political proposal intended to split possibly the Europeans from the Americans. Uh, and there also is, I should note, you know, national missile defense fits in very well with the themes I was trying to sketch. That is the idea of American exceptionalism, separateness, and so on. It's one of the reasons it's so appealing in the United States, and particularly to the Republican Party, in which those themes are particularly uh, potent. Okay. Yes. Uh, you mentioned earlier, um, 1991 Bush administration, uh, a couple of key people uh, were very against intervening in Yugoslavia. Um, one intervention you didn't really uh, mention a great deal on was uh, Somalia. That's right. Uh, which occurred at the end of 91. Um, if I remember correctly, it occurred after the presidential election. Is that right? In 92, actually. 92. December 92. But it, sorry, I beg your pardon. It mm -hmm. was just before Clinton took office. That's right. Um, I just wanted to ask your opinion. If the Bush administration was um, against intervention in general after the Gulf War for electoral reasons, yet at the end of 92 did go into Somalia, just before they were leaving office, having lost the election, what was the rationale? Was that um, a great example of great power cynicism, which he seems to have been uh, mentioning in some way or other this evening. Um, <laughs> secondly, uh, I'd just like to throw in a very brief second question. Uh, what's your view on the Chinese embassy bombing in Belgrade earlier this year? Mm -hmm. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Um, that, that's an excellent question about Somalia, and I'm sorry I didn't mention it, um, along with a lot of other things I didn't mention. Um, why did uh, the United States go in at the end of 1992? It is true Bush had been uh, uh, defeated. Um, there had been film, you may remember, in August 92 of Omarska and other concentration camps in northern Bosnia, which caused Clinton to attack Bush very vigorously for doing nothing uh, to alleviate suffering in Bosnia. I think that's part of the reason they went into Somalia, actually. Uh, General Powell, then the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has said if there had been no Bosnia, there never would have been a Somalia. That is, that the idea of U.S. action in a place that offered relatively little risk, as it was then thought, and showing U.S. troops alleviating suffering, helping people, uh, and also at the direction of a president who was on his way out and who I think felt strongly he wanted to do something. His wife was reputed to have been very sympathetic as well, Barbara Bush. Um, but, you know, much of what happened there tends to prove, I think, what I've been saying. And for subsequent presidents, stands, or president stands as an example of the political risk of taking on interventions. Um, President Bush appeared one day, I remember it vividly, uh, at about five in the afternoon, made a speech, he'd already been defeated, saying, sometimes America must act. That was the notable line uh, about Somalia. There was no debate, nothing in Congress. A warlord, a deed, and so on, that was what went wrong. I have a rather different view. My view is that the intervention from the beginning was ill-considered, it was politically unsupported, they made no attempt to convince anyone or take it to Congress, which meant that when 18 servicemen were killed with a single television image of, a, a serv of an airman being dragged through the streets, the political support, what there was of it anyway, collapsed. Congressmen immediately attacked, uh, um, and the intervention ended very quickly thereafter. Um, the other point is that you know, it was, it was set, set up as a mission to serve the starving hot meals. It was like a lunch program. Um, and in fact, the, 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 starving, the starvation in Somalia was an epiphenomenon of the war. The starving didn't just happen. It wasn't simply that it hadn't rained. There was a war there. So to intervene to simply feed people was a rather illogical step. Because eventually, if you didn't engage with the political difficulties of the country, you weren't going to solve anything. So I believe it was ill-considered from the beginning. But I think without Bosnia, there would have been no Somalia. And interestingly enough, without Somalia, there might have been some action taken in Rwanda, which was the worst of these genocides, in which I 
to my shame, I've also not mentioned tonight, which five to 800,000 people died in a matter of two or three months. And the United States was absolutely unwilling to get involved in any way, even down to shipping uh, UN forces there using its planes. And the main reason for that, I mean, Haiti was also affected. Um, troops were, were supposed to go into Haiti. They were withdrawn. You may remember the Harlan County was the boat. Um, so it had, uh, it had a very large, Somalia had an enormous effect. You know, 18 dead servicemen has echoed throughout the decade and has shown subsequent politicians what a risk it is to engage in action abroad. You know, there is a passage in George Stephanopoulos' memoir of Clinton in which he has Clinton during this, when the Marines, the Rangers are being killed, he's hearing about it by radio from the site. And he's saying, you know, Americans don't, know at their heart that they, in their bellies, they don't give a damn for this, for Mogadishu and Somalia. They'll, they'll have no idea why we're there and we have to get out. I mean, he says this very bluntly. Um, what was the second, uh, the second, your second question was? Chinese. Oh, I beg no, your pardon. Chinese. Of course, the Chinese. You know, um, <laughs> I've read an awful lot about that. Um, and of course, there have been uh, various pieces, some of them extensive, some of them with sourcing within NATO itself, among other places, claiming that the Chinese uh, embassy, and in particular the part of it that was bombed, uh, was being used as a communication relay point or otherwise involved in talking to uh, Serbian paramilitary forces in the field, notably those of the presumably late uh, Archon. I am say presumably late because there's a theory afoot that Archon wasn't killed and still walks among us. But perhaps he's in the audience tonight. I don't know. Uh, um, sorry? He's in the Hague. Oh, that's good to know. Um, uh, in any case, I, though I've read a lot about it, and though it seems absolutely preposterous that this could have been an accident uh, with the uh, remarkably stupid details that you read about, the explanations that have come out, I must tell you I've read nothing terribly convincing uh, suggesting that this was planned um, uh, in American intelligence community. Of course, that means nothing. It would be likely that one wouldn't read it. But I've read no uh, convincing explanation uh, or account. But this is among the risks you would take. Among the risks? Oh, you mean of bombing uh, the yes. Chinese embassy? Well, I mean, there's always a risk that when you start bombing, that you might hit something ill-conceived. Uh, well, of course, with, this with, wasn't with considerable consequences. Of course, but this was a different kind of risk than the bomb. You know, it's interesting. The same day, if I'm not mistaken, a bomb fell on the marketplace at Nice uh, and killed a lot of people. It was a cluster bomb, and it, it received almost no attention because of the Chinese embassy bombing. Uh, you but, know, but the question behind this is perhaps that there is no debate, and, and because in your writing, human rights and moral engagement take a large place. <laughs> right. So now, this criticism of Amnesty International, don't you think that for the mor moral coherence, that at least one should consider the possibility that NATO committed war crimes during that war? My view is they have to consider it, but. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the, I'm sorry, there's so many matters to discuss here. The human rights organizations are in a fascinating position now. Um, they were started, uh, I mean, I think it's unappreciated how much they were dependent to some degree on the Cold War. Um, the major U.S. human rights organizations, m most of them started during El Salvador, and they were about fact gathering. The Reagan administration had said, no, not so many people are being killed as you say. The human rights organizations grew up as uh, agencies that reported information. That's how they made arguments. They said, actually, 500 people died last week in a massacre in El Salvador. Now, they have been transformed, particularly as a government like that of the United States uses human rights as a pretext or simply a reason for, say, the engagement in Kosovo they have been put in a very different position, which is what is their political position going to be on this war? And I would, I would say, well, I hope you'll answer this, but I would say we can make this more specific by saying, look at when the indictment was handed down for Milosevic during the war. 
Now, someone cynical might say, uh, excuse me, he's being indicted now. Why didn't this happen years ago? Why is he being indicted now? And someone cynically might say, um, well, partly because information was withheld by the United States and other governments who needed Milosevic to make Dayton, and to not only to make the deal at Dayton, but to make it stick. So, but that, that is a real dilemma. That is a real dilemma. I mean, and that is, of course, at the core of all these questions surrounding intervention. You need allies. Mm -hmm. You can't disentangle yourself completely from this kind of realistic assessment. And the question remains, uh, Bild, the, the representative of the European mm -hmm. Union, he said Tuchman should be at the same level as Milosevic, as a war criminal in The Hague. But of course, everybody supported uh, Tuchman and he solved the problem in other ways himself. Yes. But um, I don't know if you would, you would view it that way, but that's true. No, no, but, <laughs> but, but the question of moral coherence, how is it possibly can be achieved in the middle of these, uh, of such a civil war or um, a war of Yugoslavia breaking up, is a real one. And I find sometimes in your writing that you underestimate this dilemma, mm -hmm. and that you criticize the behavior of governments from the position of moral coherence, which is, I think, almost impossible to arrive at in the midst of uh, such a, a war which happened in Yugoslavia. I, I would not be surprised to find myself guilty of such a of such a sin, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think the dilemma certainly is a real one. And you and I were talking earlier today about I, 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 even more obvious dilemma. You know, speaking to Elliot Abrams, who is the Assistant Secretary of State for Latin American Affairs, in effect, in the uh, Reagan administration, who was an official responsible for prosecuting and, and promoting the Salvador War in which untold massacres were going on. I mean, it was essentially a lot of killing of civilians. Um, he would argue like this, well, you come to me and talk about how this war is being fought. You talk about the peasants who are being killed. Uh, but in fact, we are trying to stop the advent of a Leninist regime in which a great many more people would die. And you argue with me that that would not happen if this regime came to power. And let me tell you about this person who's in the FMLN, and let me tell you about that person. And you know, this, so this conflict, even on the moral level, I mean, even discussing this on the level of what is a moral US foreign policy, I mean, that Niebuhr pointed out, mm -hmm. and others have, he better than most, mo much better than most, um, is very real, and I think it's just become more and more evident now. Um, and, and more that, that and more tangled. Strange, strange to the extent that now, of course, the claim for more pure yes. engagement on the side of human rights is now everywhere heard because it isn't meshed up with, you know, the struggle with against realism. communism. And so it can be advocated in a much purer way. But then, if you want to do that, I would say that then you have to stick and, and, and oblige yourself at least to, to more coherence than is now perceived. For example, in the case of Tuchman, I mean, turning a blind eye on him cleansing the Crimea in '95 didn't make the moral moral indignation in the West Absolutely. any stronger. But of course, you're talking about the question is whose moral coherence are we talking about? I mean, the moral coherence, moral coherence, however difficult it is to achieve at the Hague, uh, or within the halls of human rights organizations. Mm -hmm is enormously easier to achieve than it is within the halls of great powers, and particularly that of the decision-making bodies of the United States. I, I tried to argue a little bit that what allowed the U.S. to take a world wor role and a continuing world role was a combination of moral uh, evangelism and realistic foreign policy, or realistic threat, mm -hmm. if you'd like to put it that way, melded together. and. Uh, it didn't, it, it allowed all kinds of errors and mistakes because it wasn't particularist. It didn't point to different areas of interest. But the interesting thing now, in talking about the shards of policy lying over the landscape, uh, is, is not uh, the superfluity, it seems to me, of moral feeling, of that the, the United States should act morally in the world, but how and when and what are our responsibilities, but the lack of understanding of what the realistic, the realism side is. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, how do you talk to your public and 
try to describe to them what is in the interests of the country, what parts of the world, how do you map out chunks mm -hmm. of the world that in fact are vital interests or interests of the United States. Governments have, it, the American government has never been willing to do that. It didn't have to do it during the Cold War, in effect. Mm -hmm. uh, it is certainly not willing to do it now. So the realist side of it, I think, uh, in a strange way, doesn't exist. And Americans tend to understand these things publicly, I mean, it makes sense, as what should we do now? Should we help these people? Um, it's, it's an interesting matter that I think Americans but come in contact. So, so you feel that there is growing moral sensitivity? I, I think there is, but there is also, I think people ask the questions, but they remain to be convinced by their leaders. And that need to be convinced runs headlong into the political risk perceived mm -hmm. by American leaders when undertaking this, which was embodied in Somalia. Okay, one more last question, because we have to um, wind up, Frank. That lady's had her hand up for oh, a while, Oh, sorry, too. well, she... Maybe she can be... Sorry. You may as well. Two last questions. You too. <laughs> Um, okay. Thank you very much. I um, was just wondering, hearing uh, the views of Mr. Danner, um, uh, uh, saying, telling us that the uh, American foreign policy at the moment is a kind of post-ideological policy, uh, claiming a kind of interventionist approach if I understand them correctly, on more or less moral grounds. Um, m my question is, where um, would, um, how would he select the cases that made a humanitarian intervention necessary, and how would he uh, discard the others? I mean, how, you, how do you make a, uh, a distinction between the two? Um, so. In fact, my question is, what kind of ideology would you now recommend for the American foreign policy in that sense? Thank you. Well, that's... <laughs> and, uh, one and a half minutes. <laughs> that's right. That's a big one. Um, let me say, first of all, that the United States intervenes in a lot of places every day. We tend to let the word intervention stand for military intervention. Of course, military intervention is only reaches a point, even when it becomes considered publicly, of some kind of crisis. That is, the consideration of a military intervention somewhere almost inevitably represents a diplomatic and oftentimes an economic failure on the part of American policymakers. And I say that by definition. Um, the intervention in Panama under Bush was thought to be successful. When a nation of 270 million intervenes in a country of 3 million, a country that it has in effect created and has to go in and seize the country and so on, that is a failure. Um, so the question is, how do you uh, operate a wise diplomacy which uh, tends to anticipate problems, tends not to isolate whole continents, uh, like Africa, for example, and pull back uh, resources from them, uh, tries to anticipate problems and solve them before they become questions of have to, how do we go in and get our embassy people out. That represents uh, a long-range disaster. Now, to be more specific, uh, my view, as implied, I think, in what I've said here tonight, is the United States' appetite and the Americans' appetite for military intervention uh, is very small. Um, it has to be ideologically backed. It has to be for a clear reason. And politicians have to be willing to make the case clearly, repeatedly, and persuasively to the people. Uh, the US, I believe, the pr present preponderance will be reduced over the next decade. The idea of the unipolar moment, the one superpower, uh, which is so brooded about in Washington, is, is going to be remembered as something that was relatively limited in time. And I think the, the wisest course for the United States to play now is to encourage the Europeans to develop uh, their separate 
uh, foreign policy and, de and defense capability uh, to help the Russians become integrated into Europe under something like the uh, CSCE or some other body, um, uh, some other body that has some flexibility, to bolster the United Nations uh, as an intervener of last resor resort with a force that, if not, if it's not a standing force, uh, at least is a force that can be called into being quickly, that trains together, that can be used uh, for a place like Sierra Leone, for example. Um, and in other words, to develop a hierarchy uh, for stability in the world. Um, the U.S. can't do this by itself, but the beginning of achieving such, uh, such uh, a situation is a recognition that continuing to have preponderant power in the world uh, is an impossibility for the United States, preponderant power with a reluctance uh, to intervene. Um, I think, you know, I titled this essay that I was quoting from before when I quoted uh, uh, Truman, Marooned in the Cold War. Um, I think the U.S. grand strategy looks backward instead of forward uh, until it starts looking forward, um, not only in terms of financial and trade policy, but in terms of military and diplomatic policy. Um, your question is going to continue to, be, to hang there in the air, I'm afraid. Okay. I got that a sign that um, no, she's, okay. the other question will hang in the air could forever. I, could I briefly, before you sign off, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Anne Wertheim very much for her persistence and charm and elegance in general, and for dinner in Berkeley uh, with her family for getting me here, and Bram Buxhorn uh, for having me here. I've really enjoyed very much speaking to you tonight. I'm sorry I, uh, I spoke so long, but uh, I enjoyed it if, if you didn't. <laughs> We will try to forgive you for that. <laughs> okay, Bram, uh, we'll speak the closing words. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as the director of the Netherlands Atlantic Association, um, it's a pleasure to conclude this evening with a couple of remarks. I'll be very brief. First of all, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Mark Denner and Paul Schaeffer for uh, the discussion uh, this evening. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, uh, for the historical introduction on American foreign policy. It reminded me of my uh, student years when I followed a seminar on American historiography. Oh uh, and one of the academic supervisors uh, used to introduce the topic always, every week with quotation saying that uh, today's world situation is confusing. <laughs> and he repeated that every time. I think it's uh, thanks to uh, Mark Denner. And Paul Schaeffer also as journalists, scholars, researchers um, who make uh, from time to time the world a little bit uh, more uh, comprehensive and uh, a little bit better to understand. Thank you, and I think they deserve an applause for that. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, the Netherlands uh, Atlantic uh, Association has developed tradition to offer its guest speaker, sorry Paul, not for you, its guest speaker, wow. um, a compact disc. Um, oh. we have, um, our choice has been determined by uh, uh, the topic of this evening uh, and um, the, uh, what was it, the helpless giant. Um, one might argue that on this, on this continent, the European continent, there's only one helpless giant, that is the Russian Federation. Uh, mm. So uh, our choice is for Russian music. <laughs> um, it's entitled uh, Eye on the Terrible, a well-known uh, piece of music. I know it well. Um, it's uh, played by a Dutch orchestra um, with a Russian conductor, and I will hand it over to you, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you um, very much. Furthermore, I'd like to thank uh, the John Adams Institute, its director, Anna, and its staff for um, the constructive cooperation uh, with this event. And uh, for you, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you for attending this meeting, and I hope to see you soon at one of uh, our meetings, either here at the John Adams Institute or at uh, one of the meetings of the Netherlands Atlantic Association. Thank you very much. <laughs>